Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text upon which we base our meditation today is the Gospel lesson in Luke chapter 9. I'd just like to repeat the last two verses. Then he said to them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, this is a simple little text today. And yet there are certain things in here that make me pause and reflect and ask myself to think about it a little deeper than just the surface words that are there. Something simple is when they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. When you think of Jesus and being here on this earth in his ministry, how do you rate his maturity level? I mean, as a Christian my entire life, Jesus I know was smart, at least to begin that, and he was wise to begin that. So I think of his maturity level was just off the charts. He was that already at age 12 when he's in the temple and the theologians are talking to him and they were amazed at this 12 year old now let me ask you a question think of a 30 year old male that you know right now what do you think of their maturity level now, that's going to vary isn't it in this congregation if you're still in high school or even college or younger than college and high school 30 year old they're old I remember when I turned 30 and I got a t-shirt from one of my friends. 30 years isn't old if you're a tree. I felt it when I was 29. That was the year it's like, oh no. I'm going to be 30 later this year. I'm going to be 30 later this year. 29 was a tough year because I, as long as you're 29, you can always say you're in your 20s. But once you hit 30, it's, it's downhill after that. And it starts right then. As soon as you turn 30 that first day, it starts going downhill. Now if you're 60 or older, what's the maturity level in your eyes of a 30-year-old? They're kids. They're still wet behind the ears. They don't know what life is really all about yet. Maturity level? We don't even let anybody that young become president of the United States. We have a law against that. Jesus was 30 when he's teaching and preaching and healing and helping. And yet at the same time, by these answers, they must have thought he must be mature beyond his years. He's too young to not have been sort of come from the past. Because who did they think he was? John the Baptist, who was dead. He had been beheaded a while back. Elijah, he's been dead a long time. Or maybe some other prophet that's already dead and, and came back to life because the maturity that he shows, the wisdom that comes out of his mouth, the compassion for all people is special. These were compliments, confused compliments, as they talked about it and made rumors about who they thought Jesus from Nazareth really was. But they were compliments. And then something as simple as his next question, who do you say I am? And Peter's wonderful answer, God's Messiah. Messiah, Christ, same word, different language. Messiah is Hebrew, Christ is Greek. Both mean anointed, chosen by God. Anointed, picked for a purpose. Just like a king would be anointed to be king. And this prophet like Samuel would be anointed to be the prophet that he was. Samson was anointed to be a judge and sort of a one-man terrorist, terrorist organization too. And this was the anointed. God's anointed. God's Messiah. God's chosen one. God's Christ. And Peter gets commended. 
And yet at the same time he says, don't tell everybody yet that, because the rest of the world and the rest of the people that we're even addressing might not be ready for that. They'll take it the wrong way. Especially since most people are still looking for a worldly Messiah. Somebody anointed to be the great king again. To be a great king like David. To be a warrior. To get rid of the Romans. To get rid of the slavery they were under, the taxes they were under, and give them freedom again and make them their own independent nation. And most of the people weren't ready for that, so let us me keep teaching more. Let them understand my real reason and who a real Messiah is supposed to be. And so I think of the simple text, but I think of the important question that's there today. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus in my mind? Who is Jesus, more importantly, in my heart? And how do I look at him viewed from my soul? I mean, we have different names for him at Christmas. We put some of those up along the wall. We got Jesus, we got Christ, we got Emmanuel, we got Son of God, Savior. Those are the things that remind us of his titles and some of the things that he was going to do. I think of characteristics, selfless, compassionate, caring about others, proclaimer of the truth. And then I think of other things that I like to call him, my Savior. Psalm 23, my shepherd. And one of my favorite songs about prayer, my friend. That question is very important. In fact, I label it as one of those life or death questions is how do you answer it? To believe Jesus is all these things that I just mentioned takes faith. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit gives us his faith to not know Jesus just as a historical figure or as a good man who lived a long time ago who had nice things to say, but as my Savior, as my Shepherd, and as my friend. When we were at convention, we were talking about how frustrating it is, even for us pastors, to try and witness this same idea to other people to get them to answer the question the right way. Who is Jesus? It's interesting how many people have hardened themselves to just the fact that there is no God. There's no God, there's no heaven, there's no hell. So to try and get somebody to say, you're a sinner in need of salvation, a savior is available, it's like, and so? Since there's nothing out there that we can't see, nothing out there that science can't prove, there is no heaven, there is no hell, there is no God. So to try and get somebody to understand you need a Savior, and a free one is available! Oh. <laughs> As we talk in frustration, that's why it's even harder. I mean, when I was growing up, every one of my friends believed in God. They might be Catholic, they might be Methodist, they might be Baptist, but I had no atheist friends. And it's not because I hated atheists. So that's why I wasn't friends with them. There weren't any. My whole neighborhood. And I grew up in a neighborhood where all the homes were built about the same time. And all the young parents moved in about the same time. There were 35 kids. If I went six houses one way and eight houses the other way and the comparable amount across the street, we had 35 kids within two or three years of me. We had to have three teams when we played baseball. And that's just from ringing doorbells and saying what time we're going to start today. When we played kick the can, you know how far that can was before it finally got its last kick? Kids, ask your parents what that game is later. But yes, we had that can all the way down the block before the final kid had to grab it and bring it back to the driveway and then try, trying to find us to see where we were hiding. And they were all Christian, one flavor or another. That's not the case today. Remember me telling you about Ora Schultz, who was in the nursing home and was trying to figure out who she had to witness to before God would finally let her to go to heaven. So every new resident she would witness to, and she would tell about Jesus as her Savior. And I would come and visit her, and she says, wasn't it yet? 
But she also expressed her frustration at people her age. Her age. She expressed frustration at people her age. Because one of two things. Either there wasn't heaven, because there is no God, so there's nothing to worry about. Or, if they did believe there was a God, and they did believe there was a heaven or hell, their other answer that came out so often was, it's too late for me. It's too late for me to change. It's too late for me to believe. It's too late for me to have a Savior. It's too late for me to make up for my past sins. And when she would try and get them to understand, it's free. It's free. It's a Christmas present. It's a gift. The cynicism of old age, the skepticism of old age, was cemented in their personality with, that's too good to be true. Therefore, it can't be true. Her frustration in trying to get people to understand this wonderful thing that you and I believe, this wonderful thing that sometimes I take for granted, this wonderful blessing that I have with God the Father because of His love for me to send His Son to die for my sins so I have the free gift of eternal life. How wonderful that you and I can answer that question correctly. We know who Jesus is. Our Lord, the Son of God, our Savior, and our friend. So I then look at this text in connection with Father's Day today and say, what is my job as a man? What is my job as a father? Well, first of all, to acknowledge the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for what they have done during this Pentecost season. To thank God the Father for giving me life, for thank God the Son for giving me eternal life, and thank God the Holy Spirit for helping me believe it's all true. Because I still have doubts from time to time. I have lots and lots of questions that I hope I'll have the ability to remember when I'm in heaven and say, question number 37. Why did you do this at this time in my life? Or how come you let this happen to the earth? Or how come we have these two people running for President of the United States in 2016? How come? That's maybe question 420. We'll work our way down. It's not a really important question, but it's a question. The ups and downs of life, as I mentioned before with David. He had questions. Why have you forsaken me? He should be shot, fried, or something for that blasphemy, shouldn't he? How could he be a Christian and a lover and truer believer of God and have questions like that? Because he did. Because he did. My God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? It wasn't that he didn't have faith in where he would end up for eternity, but he had questions about the way things were going in this life right now. And whether that was written when he's on the run from Saul, who was during his Robin Hood days, or whether that was when Absalom, his one of his sons, had pulled that coup and sent an army to get Dad dead. Or one of his other sons later pulled off the same thing, not as famous because he didn't have long hair and get caught in a tree and die. Or just maybe it was a bad day. And he wrote Psalm 22. But as I said before, you know who wrote Psalm 23 also? Because he still had that faith in God. He still knew the right answer to the question, who God was, his Lord and his Savior. So as a man, as a father, first I want to do is thank God today and thank him for my faith and pray that he helps me continue to have a childlike saving faith. In spite of my fears, doubts, worries, concerns, anxieties, that I still say, I know who you are, and I know what you've done for me, and I know what you want to give me for eternity. And then my second big job as a man and as a father, affect people around me. <coughs> you heard me say that when my father died, his boss from Prudential came up to me and told me why he had hired my father originally. That my father had put down on the application, what are your, what is, what are your goals in life? And he just filled in that box, get to heaven. 
I also told you that I want to up my, want up my father with my goals in life. Goals in life get to heaven. Number two, and I will tell this to the catechism class usually every year, and drag as many with me as possible. <laughs> tell the kids in catechism class, I don't care how well you learn words like justification, sanctification, atonement, redemption, and all the other theological words that are not in our general regular vocabulary. My big concern is I want to see you in heaven. I want to see you continue to have a relationship with God, the true God, and Jesus is your Savior, that he's your friend, he's your buddy, and he's one that you worship regularly because you understand how much he has done for you and how much he means to you. So what do I need to do? I need to teach, I need to educate, because I need to remind myself, osmosis is not the number one method of getting my faith across to somebody else. Sit next to him and hope it moves. If you don't remember what the word osmosis looks, was, again, from chemistry or whatever, look that one up today. So you young people tell the old people when you get home what osmosis means, and you old people tell the young people what kick the can game is. There, you both got a project to do. Doesn't work. Osmosis doesn't work. I took them to Sunday school. I sent them to church. I <laughs> No, it needs more than that. You need to model. You need to push. And you need to nag. Yes, nag. It's your job as a parent. No matter if they tell you, I hate you. Your job is to nag. I miss my wife. She's been gone for a while. Nobody's nagging me. Fortunately, Kristen's trying to pick up the task. <laughs> She's too nice, though. She's not doing a very good job of it. It's very subtle. You know, like a theater actress, very subtle. And I'm not really that smart to pick up on it, but I know what's happening, because mom has told her to while she's gone. No, I know the best thing and that I want to do once in a while. Teach is important. Educate, model, those, those are the most important. Push and nag, only if you start getting desperate. Uh, but inspire. Inspire. You take all those together and you put inspire in there. Inspire to believe that our God is awesome. Inspire to trust that no matter what happens, oh, He is our friend and He does love us and He has wonderful compassion in our lives. Inspire to thank that when I come to worship, it is real. It is the prayer I pray before, my ser before the service starts. My prayer is, help me use my brain while I am worshiping you today. Now that's not a very formal prayer. You won't probably find it in any books anywhere. It's a wonderful thing to pray. Help me use my brain while I worship you. But help me that my brain doesn't go into neutral while I go through hymns I know. And liturgy I know and have memorized. Help me to use my brain so I'm actually thinking about worshiping you today. And then follow. Help me to follow the life that I live. I see that in that, that verse about take up your cross and daily follow me. I didn't get that as a kid. Because to me, the daily cross was the cross for being a Christian. And what cross was there? I had all Christian friends. Nobody picked on me for my faith. Oh, they might have picked on me a little for being a Lutheran. But it wasn't very mean. I never felt I had a cross to bear because I went to church. I went to Sunday school. I went to catechism class. I went to Lutheran schools. I never felt a cross was on my back. The burden of being that. As it is for some of the young people today. But I realize that's not really what the cross is all about there when he talks about take up your cross daily and follow me. It's the life you have. And all the ups and downs that go with it. It doesn't have to be religiously related. It can be the health problem you have. It can be the relationship problem you have. It can be the job problem you have. It can be your kids. It can be your parents. It can be many, many things. 
your car breaking down, your lawnmower not working, somebody made dessert wrong. <laughs> can be so many little things and some big ones that are your daily cross. And Jesus simply says, pick it up, follow me. That's a challenge. And that's why we need to use the word inspire. Inspire to believe, inspire to trust, inspire to thank, and let us inspire each other to follow our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen. <coughs> Please arise. May the love of God, which he has for you and for me, and which goes beyond our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds focused on Christ Jesus. Amen.